Namaste. Well, it's early, early in the morning. Sun isn't even thinking of getting up yet. <laughs> but I've been up for some time, so I thought I'd make a little video. Before we get into Mandukya Upanishad and all that, I want to talk about perfectionism versus perfection in spiritual life. Because it's up. You know, uh, this is a very highly energized time. Very fiery energy. Mars is getting ready to station and go retrograde in uh, Gemini. So, there's a lot of conflict brewing, which will probably come to a head mm, within the next couple of weeks and definitely by the end of the year after the solar eclipse. So, we have to realize that perfectionism is a trap. This material body is never going to be perfect. This material life, this mind, uh, is never going to be perfect. It can't be. It's not its nature. That which is born in ignorance can never become perfect. Perfection is not on this material plane of existence. It's an unreachable goal. You notice, I don't put a lot of effort into making these videos perfect. You know? I mean, sure, I could make them better. <laughs> I could add a lot of animation and graphics and all kinds of fancy stuff. But would that really help get the message across? Or would it just kind of obscure it with a bunch of flash? Like I was talking about last time. The pretension of perfection. So, real perfection, if, if it's not in this level of reality, where is it? Well, it begins to manifest in sushupti deep sleep consciousness, or what appears to be deep sleep on the material level. Actually, it's when we first come in contact with Brahman. That's why Shiva is identified with Sushupti. But in the realm of the body and the mind, Jagrat and Svapna, there's no perfection. Can't be. It's against its nature. And this is what drives us to seek perfection. But perfectionism is the wrong-headed notion that perfection is possible on this plane. It's not. A lot of people think that if they perfectly follow the rules in the scriptures, they'll get enlightened. No, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. The so-called rules in the scriptures are actually principles, meaning they're directions of purpose. They're lines of effort that we should strive to emulate and follow and, and advance in. But that doesn't mean that we can get to the perfection. Huh? As I've talked many times, this world is temporary, imperfect, full of suffering and ignorance, and not self, very important. This world is not our self. It's not who we are. So this body, this mind, this is not our real self. This is just a temporary identity, a vehicle, if you will for the deeper part of our self, our real self, which is consciousness. Now, consciousness is perfect. It's a perfect mirror. 
consciousness always perfectly reflects whatever is put before it, just like a mirror. And more than that, it takes the shape and form and nature and quality of that which is before it. And by mirroring the reality, it illuminates it and actually brings it into manifestation for us. This is the power of consciousness. This is Shiva. This is Sushupti and Turiya. The real perfection is in Turiya, where there's no qualities, no actions, no form, <laughs> no time, space, cause and effect, and all that stuff. So, what does that mean? It means forgiveness is a, such an important quality. If we are perfectionist, if we're deluded by perfectionism, and we think it's possible to, like, follow all the rules in the scriptures or, you know, do some material task or work perfectly, we're always going to be disappointed. If we think that we can have an experience that perfectly matches our desires, we're going to be disappointed because it never does. So we have to forgive, forgive the world, forgive nature, forgive even God for not meeting our expectations, for not fulfilling our desires, because it's not possible. We should also forgive others for not meeting whatever expectations we have according to our beliefs and outlooks and views. Huh? Otherwise, we constantly live in an atmosphere of criticism and rejection. And that's ugly. That's not love. Love means, first of all, acceptance of others and all their imperfections, so-called imperfections. <laughs> Actually, to the enlightened person, the world is perfect. It's just the way God made it. And, and God made the world in the beginning as one single whole, from beginning to end. Everything connected together. Everything perfect. Just the way it is. We really don't have anything to do with it. When I say we, huh, I mean ourselves, our empirical selves, as individuals. But, of course, the real self with a capital S is not an individual. This is Atman, Brahman, the self. So... <laughs> When we contemplate these things, we have to feel like most people are totally off on the wrong track. Uh, they're expecting everything to be perfect, or at least they're expecting uh, themselves to be perfect and other people around them to be perfect. But it's unrealistic. Hmm? Just like a lot of people find fault with me because I'm tantric because I experimented with alternative sexuality and stuff like this. It's like, so what? You know, it, it's, it's none of your business, my private life, unless you want to date, you know, or something. But if you just want to find fault and criticize, well, sure, you can find so many faults. You know, if you take a shovel and dig, you're going to find dirt. And in the same way, if you dig into anybody's life, you're going to find apparent contradictions and faults and mistakes, you know, according to your way of thinking, imperfections, 
Huh? If you're a perfectionist, you're going to find imperfections. You're always going to find imperfections because this world is never perfect according to any plan or scheme or set of values, no matter what they are. Because this world embodies all possibilities. So if you think that everybody should be good, you're going to be disappointed by the people who aren't good, according to whatever definition you bring to that perception. And if you think that, for example, a, a guru should be perfect, you're always going to be disappointed because they're not perfect. Look, I know one guy <laughs> who, who's a BDSM master here in India. And uh, he told me one time he got invited by this big Swami in Vrindavan. Vrindavan is like a big holy center in India. To come there and stay with him and do BDSM practices, huh? gay BDSM. So this is going on. And my response is, so what? I mean, when you get in a plane and you go to take off, are you going to go up in the cabin and, and ask the pilots about their sexuality? And if you don't like their sexuality, are you going to get off the plane? You know? So in the same way, if you're following a spiritual teaching and, you know, you inadvertently or deliberately find out something about the sex life of the teacher or presenter or guru or whatever, and it turns out not to meet your expectations of perfection. Then you're going to drop the teaching, you're going to drop that teacher, you're going to go find fault, you're going to run away, huh? yeah, and you're going to justify your failure to understand the teaching based on your unrealistic expectations of perfection? That's nonsense, isn't it? It's really nonsense. Just like the airplane pilot, the only thing you should care about is, is he a competent pilot? So in the same way, when you're approaching a spiritual teacher or teaching, the only thing you should care about is, is the teaching right? You know, I criticize people like Muji. He got thrown out of Tiruvannamalai by the Shankaracharya of Kanchi <laughs> because of public lewdness, you know. But that's not really the problem with Muji. The problem with Muji is that he doesn't follow the scriptures in his teaching. And the other thing is just a symptom of that. So in the same way, if somebody is seen to break uh, somebody's idea of what morality is or something like that, um, that's not a big problem. Huh? The question is, are they competent? Are they aligned with the scriptures? or whatever their job description is, you know? Like my description is to present the scriptures as I have realized them. This has been my intent since the beginning of this channel, not to go on faith or theories or conjecture or speculation or even logic and reason, but by experience, because in my life, I always had the experience before I could explain it. <laughs> like in 1984 when I got Shaktipat and saw Brahman. I had no idea really what was happening. Maybe it, just a vague general idea, but really I didn't understand. It took me 30 some odd years to grasp the full meaning of that experience. 
So when you encounter something that you don't understand, the proper way to approach it is to back off and try to see how it fits with everything and what's really important. Because it's almost certain, given the fact that we're all covered with ignorance and misunderstandings, it's almost guaranteed that whatever we experience, we don't grasp it rightly. We don't really understand it. And it may take years, it may take decades before we do. And that's all right. That's the way it is. We have to forgive ourselves too. You know, just like I had to forgive my ex-students who, the, the rascals, you know, were trying to use me as a figurehead to establish a drug dealing organization. I had to forgive them. You know, otherwise I would go through life with this albatross around my neck. You know, like they do. They still hate me and they won't communicate with me. And they try to trash me every time, every chance they get. So they're burdened with their hate and their misunderstanding. But I'm free because I forgive their so-called imperfections and I go on with my life and I don't get stuck in dreams of perfection, uh, which are bound to be frustrated. And so I can be progressive. I can advance. I can get more and more understanding and I can approach the highest enlightenment. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>